Hi, Dr. Mike Carberry and I have a very special guest today. Everybody always hears the stories of um, my career and, and, and AMI from my point of view. And a lot of people have asked us to have another point of view, Colleen's point of view. So very excited to have my wife, Colleen, my beautiful wife, Colleen, be here today to share her experiences in this whole odyssey of, of building AMI and changing healthcare. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, tell me about, tell, tell our viewers about your background as a physical therapist and your specialty in brain, traumatic brain injury and so forth. Good, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, I graduated from physical therapy school at Marquette University in Wisconsin, and I went directly into treating traumatic brain injury patients. Um, during my schooling, I had done a little bit of an internship on that and loved it, so I took my first job treating um, traumatic brain injury patients. What was it that you loved about it? I think what I loved about it was, because I had done also some uh, acute care work on my internships, a little bit of outpatient, and the one thing that I loved about treating traumatic brain injury patients was there were no protocols. Oh. See, orthopedics, there's protocols, okay? Um, acute care, when you're getting somebody with a total hip replacement out of bed, there's strict protocols we have to follow. With traumatic brain injury patients, in particular with patients who are comatose, um, we had the freedom to do whatever it took to help the patients. And it really was an art form versus orthopedic physical therapy, and it's not anything to take away from orthopedic physical therapy, mm -hmm. but there tends to be uh, more rigidity and protocols um, in orthopedics, where with traumatic brain injury, it's kind of, there are, there are ways of treating traumatic brain injury patients, but in general, it's more of an art form by whatever we felt underneath our hands and, and the response we were getting from the patient. And there is a science, though, because you've explained this to me for over the years, and to me, I found it fascinating from a chiropractor's point of view of how you're stimulating that brain. So why don't you go into that? Because a lot of our viewers are not all, but a lot of our viewers are chiropractors. So why don't you explain that? Okay. And you're exactly right. There is a science. Um, there's different methods like the bow bath method. You know, when I was in school, there's absolutely courses on neurological rehabilitation. So don't get me wrong. It's not just an art form, right? So, but with that, we, you know, there's no like if you do in, in neurological physical therapy, nowhere does it say if you do this, this is what's going to happen. Because you're talking about a brain injury. You're talking about somebody who went through a windshield of a car, um, hit the pavement, um, and their brain literally sloshes in their head. So not one patient looked the same. Okay, so we did have tools, you're right. Um, but the beauty of it was, one, the, the, probably the pretty common thing was motion, okay? Putting motion in the body, hands down, was probably the, the number one thing that would uh, wake patients up from comas or give them the best chance to wake up. Motion and weight bearing, okay? So we used balls, and yes, the patients were comatose. We'd roll them over balls. We would put them on tilt tables. We'd lay them down, strap them in, stand them up, weight bear through the joints, monitor blood pressure to make sure we were getting responses and heart rate, that we actually were getting responses from patients. And it was this activity day in and day out while we monitored the patient's activity um, uh, to notice that they were beginning to wake up. And that was, to me, just fascinating. As a chiropractor, that's the part that interests me the most because what we're trying to do is we're trying to keep weight-bearing jo weight joints in motion. 90% of the weight-bearing joints is the spinal column. And so what a chiropractor is trying to do is find areas that are stuck and put it back in motion, which has a profound effect on the nervous system. And apparently, you guys discovered that. Yeah, absolutely. Well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, you were doing that, and you were pretty successful in your career. Every, I know every hospital you worked at since I've known you, you became the supervisor. Yep, that's um, true. Yep. So tell, tell our viewers a little bit about um, why you decided to work with, with me. Okay, well, I'll give you just a, kind of the short version of it. Um, so I, you're correct. I did. I was working in traumatic brain injury when we met. Um, you decided to go back to school, um, and kind of a decision we made, a financial decision, was to minimize taking loans out. And as a physical therapist at the time, and even true today, there's many opportunities and jobs. And kind of the general rule of thumb is the less desirable the job, the greater the pay. So over the years, when you were you went back to undergraduate school, and then of course you went to chiropractic school. I discovered that we could offset a lot of our costs by, and bring in more money to handle the books and all of the items through chiropractic school um, by taking these jobs that, that were less desirable, let's say. You know, I worked in um, nursing homes in very underprivileged areas. Um, I worked in the emergency rooms um, doing um, uh, cane fitting and crutch fitting on Sunday mornings when people didn't want to work, right? Um, I did all these jobs because I could get paid more 
um, and that, and of course, that offset our costs. So that when you graduated from chiropractic school, we had loans, but nothing like a lot of the other right. students had loans. So you know, at the time, it was we did what it took um, to put ourselves in the best possible position. I don't know at the time that I realized the valuable experience that I gained in in so many settings. I literally was like a contract PT. I had my full-time job working with traumatic brain injury patients, which I did every day. And then I worked nights and, and, and weekends doing anything I could to pick up extra money. Mm -hmm. And so the valuable experience I gained during that period after you graduated and then you were an associate, right? Again, I was the primary breadwinner because you were busy getting experience. As and I wasn't making a whole lot of money. No, you were not making a lot of money. No, I was probably making six times as much money as you do in contract work. I think that first year I made $26,000. As a chiropractor. And I think I made about 150000 And you have to imagine, this was back in the early 90s. Right. Yeah, doing contract work. Yeah, and I did all kinds of contract work. Well, you name it, I was willing to go into the inner cities of Philadelphia and work wherever I had to work. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. yeah. And then what happened was, I, you know, just kind of as a, a, a informational here, is that we decided we wanted to buy a house. And I was a contract PT, which means I worked for myself. You opened your first business. Right. Numbers were too young to get Nobody a loan. Nobody loan us money. Right. And we wanted a house. And back in those days, you could write a credit card check, which we did. Uh, our down payment. And Mike, you you dealt with the, the homeowners. I made a, a, an offer to the homeowners to become our mortgage holder. And um, we I laid out all the terms and the, the money they would make. And I wrote it all up. And um, they took it. And they took it. Yeah. Exactly. They took it. They said, two years, you have to remortgage in a bank. And... Uh, we had Amanda, our daughter, at that point. She was a year old, maybe yeah. maybe two years old. I don't they were know. just about to have Lauren. Yeah, I was just I wasn't quite pregnant with our second yet. That's right. So we moved into this two hundred year old house. That right? we had to renovate. That we had to renovate exactly. But right. meanwhile, he had opened his business. You know, we look back now and we realize, you know, every obstacle that we faced, we kind of were like, all right, how can we? If we want it that bad, how can we create around this obstacle? And that's basically right. what we did. I know. Yeah. yeah. I remember the one time, one night when they they were doing redoing the floor in the dining room of this two hundred year old house. And they had some of the floorboards off, and a snake came out of the floor, and everybody started screaming. So I do remember that. I do lots remember of stuff that. like that. That was fun doing that house. Yeah, it was, it was actually. Yeah. So, so I was a, still working as a as a PT, right? And he had his business, and uh, he said to me one day, "Can you come help me?" Um, every time I increase patient visits and see more patients, it seems like the front office drops, whether that's the insurance billing, the front yeah. desk, whatever. I, it really didn't really matter. It was like, just come help me. I had never managed people before. Okay, well, yeah. there you go. But I did it in, in, I did in hospital, so. Right. But, but either way, I was the primary breadwinner at this point still. Yeah. So it was my money that was supporting everything. So we had to look at each other. And again, we had to say, are we willing to step back and give up my income, okay, I was paying the health benefits, I was paying for everything, my income to work together. And so we said, okay, let's give it a try. So for three months, we gave up the income. I came and sat at your front desk, remember? Yep. And this is another story, which I look back now, God, I can't even believe I got over it, okay, was that I sat at the front desk and whoever that girl was before that- Doing the insurance? Doing the insurance. Said to me when she said, no worries, I built out all the insurance, all the billing is done. It'll be a couple weeks before you're really gonna have to do something, you can learn about it. And I was like, okay, great. So I sat in that seat and about 24 to 48 hours, the phone started ringing, okay? Screaming patients, screaming. Apparently she had hit the button and billed back billed every patient for everything that she couldn't get the insurance companies to pay and just sent all these bills out. People were screaming at me. And at the same time, I discovered I was pregnant with Lauren and I was right. so sick with morning sickness. I remember almost throwing out a patient. You did, physically. you went out and defended me. I was like, I was so sick morning sickness and this man is screaming at me about his bill. I didn't even know what a CPT code was. I didn't know what an IC-9 was. I just knew he was yelling at me. And Mike went up and, I don't know, got, told him to leave. And I said to, I said to Mike, if I don't learn how to insurance bill, we're never going to make it. I remember you had gone through a chart. You opened a patient chart and a check fell out. That's An old crazy. check that had never been cashed. That had never been cashed. That's exactly yeah, right. So. Yeah. so anyway, I actually, I learned insurance billing literally mm -hmm. by reading a book, getting on the phone and talking to the insurance reps who were kind enough to actually teach me. And that's how, over the years, I learned to do what I was doing, basically. Right. I was baptized by fire. I, li I did bring the skill set of managing people because I did it in the hospital system. And I don't know, it was all history at that point. We went to 400 visits within nine or 10 months. Right. Um, I managed the insurance billing, the front desk. You managed all the sales, the reports, and the patient care. And it was like we figured out what we both do best. Mm -hmm. We just did it at that point. Yeah, we perfectly complemented each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, And that yeah, still yeah. carries through to today. So um, tell us about your viewpoint of now working. And uh, you work with all different 
disciplines. You work with medical doctors, nurse practitioners, even physical therapists, but mostly you work with chiropractors. Mm -hmm. Did you ever imagine you would be doing that at this point in your career? Uh, I, I don't know that I imagined it. Um, I knew when we met you were going back to chiropractic school, I knew there would be one chiropractor around. <laughs> <laughs> that much I did know. That's right. Um, so, and I think having worked in the hospital system, when you work with traumatic brain injury patients in inpatient rehab, you always work on a team. So there was always a medical doctor on the team, usually a physiatrist. There was always a lead nurse. There was always an occupational therapist, cognitive therapist, speech therapist, physical therapist. So I only ever really knew my whole career, my full-time job, working on teams. So the natural um, evolution of working, worked with, when I was working with you, and we saw such high volume for so long, the miracles, you couldn't dispute the miracles we saw. That was not explainable in the medical world, ex and not explainable at all. Right. So having the benefit of working in the medical world, under, working in the hospital system, and all the, the types of jobs I had, um, you know, like I said, acute care, um, ER, you name it, ICU I worked in, having all that experience, having worked on a team, and then being introduced to this miracle of chiropractic care, to me, the whole thing came together, the team came together in my head. Mm -hmm. And of course, since I'd worked on teams before, each person, the medical doctor had value, the occupational therapist had value, the nurse's aide had value. Everybody had value on the team. It's just how I, uh, over the years, grew into, into my career. So it was when, a natural progression to bring yeah. chiropractic into the team. I remember when I was in school and we had Amanda, and I would bring her over to the hospital so you could breastfeed at lunch. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times you were in that meeting, mm -hmm. and I had to wait. Meeting, yeah. I'd sit yeah. in the hallway rocking her in a chair mm -hmm. and um, waiting for you to come out of this meeting. And that who, yeah. who I would never guess that we would have been doing that same thing in our clinic, yeah. Yeah, you know, yeah. five or six years later. We took that concept yeah. from the inpatient rehab hospital setting and took it to an outpatient setting. Because right. it actually was an incredible concept to collaborate, yeah. for, for different uh, disciplines to collaborate um, for one patient's care, to put it all together to, for recommendations for a patient's care. Yeah, absolutely. Good. So then why don't you just share a little bit about your viewpoint of the why, of, of why, like, I, I'm, I'm very passionate about why I do things. Mm -hmm. but you have reasons that you do things, and they're not always exactly the same. So tell We're not sure the same. We're close, but we're not the same. I think if anybody knows the two of us, you can tell we're very strong personalities. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> and we figured out over the years I, that, uh, we figured out over the years that what one's good at, the other one's good at, right? We figured right. out how to work together over the years to actually forward not only the why of our companies, but of our family, really. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I know you, I hear you speak about the why all the time. I'm very well aware of, of your why. Um, my why is, 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 like Mike says, is not exactly the same as, as your why, but it runs so close to it that it's not, um, um, it's not that different. Right. And, and I'll kind of give you the background on it. You know, when I worked with traumatic brain injury patients, I did that for a really long time. I'd say 12 or 13 years. Okay. When I worked with traumatic brain injury patients, it took me about four or five years to realize that I was not treating the patients. I was treating the families, okay? Remember, the patients most times either were comatose, they were combative, um, a lot of times their memory was very poor, but the families were utterly broken. By the time we got them in inpatient rehab, they'd been promised by the hospitals that, your, that their child would be fixed in rehab. So I treated, when the patients came in, yeah, I was treating the patient, but I realized I was actually treating the families. A family who was willing to take this person who was still the same person, just looked a little different, maybe acted a little different, and be willing to actually continue living life with this person. And I know it sounds weird, um, but this was so traumatic to the family that they're li literally their living stopped. Like for months, they're, they've stopped living. And so I discovered on inpatient rehab, which is why I loved it, was my job was actually to show these families that they could start living again, okay? Which means there was possibility, there was life, there was hope, okay? That's why I was so, people said, why did you ever stay doing that and treating? And I said, you don't know how fulfilling that is. So the, the why of what we do, right, okay? I, we know that with the opioid crisis, we know this is destroying families and people. And it's not just like somebody dies, okay? Remember, I take it to what I did. Okay, if the person who was in the accident was actually killed, then they could, they could grieve over a death and be done with it. But they didn't. They had this person in their life that was no longer the same that they couldn't help. And the family was dying. That was, that was really what I was treating the family. Right. It's not much different than the opioid crisis. Yeah. When a person, a family member is addicted to an opioid, the family dies along with the person. Right. Okay, so what we're, this why 
of, of actually handling bodily aches and pains, um, you know, without drugs and without surgery, people have aches and pains, right? Once they get addicted on opioids, the family dies along with the person. So this is where our whys kind of coincide, right? My yeah. why in life is to actually help people to discover that life is worth living. And it goes right on along with this. If people are addicted to opioids, the family dies. So it really, we really align in that. So you can see why I married her. <laughs> Based on that, it was that, that viewpoint on life that is just so full of life and so positive. You know, I don't know if I ever, t I guess I did tell you this, but I don't talk about it much, but I have a cousin that, who was a head injury and still in a coma 45 years later. Yeah. And uh, it just, it tore the family apart. It Here's literally tore the family apart. It, it so, absolutely does, yeah. Yeah, so anyway, well, I'm very happy to have you on my team. I've been very happy to have you on my team for the last team. 30 years, yeah. uh, 30 plus years. And uh, we're going to continue on in the future because we're not quite done yet. We still got to change healthcare. Yeah, we've got a lot to do. Yep. yep. But, but um, really excited though. It's so really exciting times. Really super exciting times. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I guess uh, the secret of our success is two positive people with different strengths that mesh together yep. and can forge ahead. And that is why we do what we do. And I'm mm -hmm. very glad to have you Thank on you. my team. <laughs> uh, okay. Good. That's it. Thanks.